I'd like to say good afternoon. I came today to share with you the Word of God from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Here today, the Word of the Lord. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So what we see here today, my dear friends, is the Apostle Paul writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And what that tells us is this, that there is a righteousness that exceeds the so-called sinful righteousness of the creature, and that righteousness is needed to inherit the kingdom of God, and that is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, my friends, without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we will forever be excluded from the kingdom of God. Without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we will forever be excluded from gaining entrance into God's heaven. No one who is destitute of the grace of God will ever enter there. No one who seeks to do injustice by a legal sanction that's upheld in the court of law will never enter into the kingdom of God. You see, all of this is encompassed in the definition of unrighteous. And the Bible's clear, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, be not deceived. There were a lot of people in Paul's day who were deceived. There are a lot of people in our day that are deceived. They are in danger of being deceived. They are in danger of being deceived by subjectivism, by arbitrariness, by moral relativism. Some are in danger of being deceived by their leaders, by politicians, by bosses, by co-workers, by friends, by family. And my dear friends, your soul is so important today that the Lord Jesus Christ said this. He said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? So please, don't imagine today that by the vain imagination of your heart that somehow you'll be saved in your unrighteousness. We need the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul goes on and he says, neither fornicators. Fornication is the committal of a lewd act as an unmarried person or as a married person with an unmarried person. That's a brief definition today of fornication. The Bible says fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God, nor will idolaters inherit the kingdom of God. Those who worship something or someone other than the one true triune God of this Bible, they are idolaters. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who worship money, those who worship the vain imaginations of their own heart, those who worship a false Jesus that they've created in their own mind, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who worship some false god, Paul said they are idolaters and they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He goes on and he says adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are they who engage in relations with someone other than their spouse. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, nor effeminate. These are they who voluntarily pollute themselves. These are they who practice no self-denial whatsoever. Now, why is this an issue? Well, because our Lord and dear precious Savior Jesus Christ said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But those who are effeminate, they practice no self-denial whatsoever. They are wrapped up in the wanton, sensual desires of their own heart. And Paul said, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Abusers of themselves with mankind shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
These are they who practice homosexuality. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I think we all know what a thief is. Someone who steals someone else's property. I think we all know what a drunkard is. Someone who becomes inebriated on a substance to the point to where they cannot think or reason according to the will of God. Such a person is a drunkard and they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul goes on and he says, Those who are covetous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These are they who are greedy of worldly gain and by any means necessary. They are out to increase their substance in life and they don't care how they do it. Whether by hook or by crook, it doesn't matter to them. They are covetous. And Paul said the covetous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Revilers shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are they who are talebearers. Those are they who are backbiters. Those are they who spread scandals about other people to try to ruin their name. They are revilers and they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says extortioners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What's an extortioner? An extortioner is one who seeks an unlawful gain by force or by duress or by the undue exercise of their power. They are extortioners and they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But I want you to hear this part, my dear friend. When the Bible says that these people shall not inherit the kingdom of God, it does not mean that these sins are unforgivable. There is pardon available in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness available to all who have committed these sins. There is forgiveness and pardon available in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, by His grace, can grant you faith and repentance and you can turn away from sin and turn to Christ, the true and the living Savior, and be made a fit subject for the kingdom of God. You can inherit the kingdom of God by turning away from sin and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this next verse because it proves exactly what I'm telling you right now. Verse number 11, But such were some of you, but now you are washed but ye are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You see, we've all been guilty of at least one of these sins. Some of us may be all of these sins. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God has demonstrated His great love and His power and pardon in the salvation of and the justification of sinners. Hallelujah. Those who have turned to Christ in faith and repentance have been washed. That means that they've been made pure by the Spirit of God. They've been forgiven. They've been made pure with a purity that will culminate in God's heaven. We are sanctified. This shows a progressive advancement of our purification which, which culminates when we reach God's heaven, Paul says, but ye are justified. That means that those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ have been pronounced just and righteous with a righteousness that is not their own. It's not on their merit, but it's on His merit. On the merit of the Lord Jesus Christ. How does all of this take place? It takes place in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's by His authority. Why? Because it's in His name that the remission of sins has been preached. And by the Spirit of our God. Because the Holy Spirit of God is the agent that is involved in that change of heart that every man and every woman needs. We all need that change of heart. We need the Spirit of God to take out that heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh that can think and love and feel and reason according to the will of God. My dear friends, God created this world and everything in it. We didn't evolve from a monkey. We didn't crawl out from under a rock. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. And God who created us is just and righteous and holy. 
Do you know Him, sir? He's just and righteous and holy. And because sin has entered into this world and death by sin, a just and a righteous and a holy God must punish sin. And the punishment that God has prescribed for sin is an eternity in an awful place called hell. But the good news is, Jesus Christ has come, born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He never committed one sin in thought, word, or deed. For 33 years, Jesus Christ, the Lord and dear precious Savior, lived a life that you and I are unable to live for 33 seconds. And He went to the cross where there He offered Himself as a sacrifice for many. And what God requires of us. But listen, He didn't stay dead. On the third day, He arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And He lives today because He has ascended to the right hand of God where He ever sits to make intercessions for the people of God. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It's not Mary, it's not Muhammad, it's not Buddha, it's not Confucius, it's not Joseph Smith. The man Christ Jesus. And what God requires of you is the same thing that God requires of me and all people. And that's that we repent and believe the Gospel. That we turn aside from a life of sin and we look to Jesus Christ and Him alone. Not some philosopher, not some professor, not mommy, not daddy, not mamma, not papa, but Jesus Christ and Him alone. For He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Him. And when we look to Christ and Him alone, we find Jesus Christ to be a perfect Savior. He is a perfect Savior today, my dear friends. It is Christ that we proclaim to you today in the public square. If you know Him in a saving way, we rejoice with you in your salvation. You are my brother or sister in the Lord. But if you don't know Christ in a saving way, the call goes out. Repent and believe the Gospel for Christ is a perfect Savior. God bless you today. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.